Well, you guys are awful chatty this morning. But this morning, we're going to begin this morning by singing of what a beautiful day it is. But God is good, and so we're going to worship him together this morning.
Heavenly Father, this morning we come before you. Lord, the God that was, that is, and who is to come, the great I Am. Lord, the very God that when the mountains hear its name, the earth trembles, the earth shakes, and the world is changed. God, that is the one that we celebrate and worship this morning. Lord, we know how great and mighty you are. Lord, we know how awesome your presence is. But Lord, this morning I would ask, Lord, as we gather in this place, as we gather at Clough Pike to celebrate the great I am, Lord, may our hearts see who you are this morning. With every head bowed, every eye closed in this moment, we sing of our great God. And sometimes I think we get very, we, we get scared of what God might ask us to do because of how great he is. This morning, Jesus is calling you out on the water as he did his disciples. He calls us into this great adventure. But the truth is, is that we desperately need the hand of our Savior to reach out and grab us when we fail. Because everyone in this room is in need of a Savior this morning. We all need Jesus. So Lord, this morning as we pray together, as we celebrate together, Lord, call us out under the water. As scary as the great unknown is, show us our need for a Savior this morning. That even when the oceans rise, we can encounter our God. Call me out upon the water, great unknown.
Father, again, show us your hand. Lord, give us your presence this morning. Lord, when the oceans rise and fear surrounds us, may we hold fast to our Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who saved our souls. Lord, be glorified in this service this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Everybody have a seat. I don't know what it is about the, the little uh, tag, the, the chorus of that, of that song. Maybe it's the, the, the borders and the wonders and the water. And every time I sing it, I want to sing it with like a Boston accent. I, I, maybe that's just me. No, <laughs> no I, I absolutely love the challenge, the challenging message of, of that song. And, and where we go in scripture this morning as we begin to move towards the close of our Sermon on the Mount series, this Living Like Jesus series, is very much in, in keeping in step with that song that as we draw towards this, this closing argument, um, we see the, the heart of Jesus continue to compel us to follow him all the more passionately. And so if you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to open up uh, to our text in Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to read it, and we are going to jump into what God uh, would like to speak to us this morning. Matthew chapter 7, and we will begin in verse 12. Jesus speaking to the crowd on the hill and to us this morning says, So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Let's pray. Father God, we come to uh, your word this morning, and what I just pray that you would speak to us. These passages that we read uh, at the close of the Sermon on the Mount, they are uh, in a lot of ways familiar, and yet I, I fear this morning that we haven't found the depth of what you are trying to say as we have done so many times in our sermons or, or in our quiet times, and we've just glossed over these familiar passages, all the while missing the challenge that you are laying before the disciples and that you're laying before us as a church. So Father, I, I pray that your spirit will move, that you will prod your people as we hear your word to be transformed into your likeness that we might live like Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, am I missing batteries this morning? Is that what's going on? Nah. Eh. Hold on. Technical difference. Now? Yeah. Okay. <sighs> Refocusing just a little bit. So 
as I read this passage this morning, I, I, and really in my prayer, I hope you heard kind of how, how I came to this passage this morning. So we read this golden rule, and how many of you have had your parents tell you the golden rule when you were growing up? You kind of heard the golden rule, you knew the golden rule. Did anybody realize that the golden rule was in Scripture? You might have, you might not have. And, and we kind of, you know, hear people tell it, and maybe not so much today, but this idea, hey, you're supposed to do to others what you would want done to yourself. And we kind of just take that as societal, you know, basically being nice to each other, right? This is just how society is supposed to be governed. Any proper civilization ought to be nice to each other. And here it is, we find the golden rule, and Jesus is saying the golden rule, and, and he's coming to the close of this sermon. So there, I, I'm reading this passage, and I'm going, there, there's something that Jesus wants us to get here. He's making his closing argument. This is supposed to be the main point. This is supposed to be the crux of the message. And, and as I read this, I'm going, the golden rule, really? That's what you want to open up with, Jesus? Is, is that what you have for us this morning? Is, is that what you want us to read? I mean, I get it. Listen, as, as Christians, we're supposed to be nice to each other. That's an, an important thing, but isn't everybody supposed to be nice to each other? Unbelievers teach their children to be nice to each other. Sometimes it doesn't hit, help. They still hit each other, but I'm telling you, I'm teaching them to be nice to each other and so this is what you open up with, Jesus. This is your closing argument. This is the main point that you want us to get. He says, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Is this what you're wanting us to understand, Jesus? Is this the crux of your message? See, at first glance, there's nothing uniquely surprising about this verse. It's common sense, really, right? Whatever you want done to you, be, you know, do it for others. And, and maybe you've crossed this before and, and you might have said something along these lines. Jesus, you know, we really don't come to you for common sense, though perhaps we ought to do that more often. You know, we come to Jesus for that deep spiritual insight, don't we? We want that, that born-again stuff, that washed-in-the-blood stuff, that life-in-the-spirit stuff, and we read the golden rule, and we just go, eh. What is it that Jesus is really getting at? Right? The summit of his teaching, is, is this it found in this passage? But like I said, that's only at first glance. See, as I read the passage and as I worked over this passage in my heart and read commentaries on this passage, I, I began to realize that there is indeed something incredibly unique, something incredibly sublime about this golden rule passage. And, and I don't want you to miss it. I didn't just want to gloss over it because I feared if I just glossed over this golden rule passage, I wouldn't do it justice to what Jesus is saying. And so there's something that he wants us to get. And so for starters, this is what you need to know about Jesus saying this golden rule. Do unto others as you would have done to you. And, and it's very, very simple. It's this. It had never been said before. It had never been said before. In all the years of civil, civilization, right, for the Egyptians and the Sumerians and the time they were living in, the Greeks and the Roman empires of the day, it had never been said before. Does that not just strike you as a, a little bit odd? That something so simple would not have been said before. Now, Here's what's even more interesting. It is absolutely possible to quote rabbinical teaching of the time for almost everything that Jesus has said in the Sermon on the Mount. But there is no real parallel to this saying it is a completely new teaching and it is a completely new way of life altogether. Now it is not incredibly difficult in Jewish teaching or in teachings of other religions to find foils or parallels um, in the negative form. Every time up to this point that something similar was said, it was said in a negative way. 
to give you a few examples, one of the most famous Jewish teachers, Hillel, is quoted as saying, what is hateful to yourself, do to no other. The book of Tobit, which is a book included in the Septuagint, a Greek transliteration of the Old Testament, plus some additional books that are generally called apocryphal, is quoted as saying, what thou hast hated, do to no other man. The Jewish work, the letters of Aristeus, answers an Egyptian king when uh, they were down in Egypt. They were writing the Septuagint at the time, and the Egyptian king asked the Greek, uh, or I'm sorry, the, asked the Hebrew teachers of the time, he says, what is the teaching of wisdom? And they responded, and they said, with as you wish that no evil should befall you, but to be a partaker of good things, you should also act on the same principle towards others. And perhaps that is the closest that anyone gets to this teaching here that we find in the Sermon on the Mount. In other religions, in Confucianism, we find the story of Se Kung asking Confucius, and is there one word which may serve as a rule of practice for all of one's life? And Confucius replies, is it not reciprocity? Such a word. What you do not want done to yourself, do not to others. The Greeks and the Romans also taught basically the same thing. There's a story of a king who advises their sub, the subordinate officials, do not do to others the things which make you angry when you experience them at the hands of other people. And you're listening to all this and you're probably asking the same question that would be very, very natural. So what? Well, I'm not going to leave you hanging. What's the point? And here it is. In the negative. In the negative form, the teaching is only to not do that which is displeasing or offensive. The positive encompasses this. And also so much more. It includes the requirement that we are to do good for others as well. The idea of the gospel being lived out in our lives is that we are to model the life of Christ, which is to seek and save that which is lost, which is to rescue the perishing, to care for the dying, as the old hymn says, which is to put others before ourselves. The very idea that the King of heaven has come down to earth to die for you and me. Is the idea that he loved us even more than he loved himself. And so at the pinnacle of living like Jesus, this idea, this golden rule, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also for them, is not just to do them no harm. And I think that's the way we, all, we often read this golden rule. This is the way we often teach this golden rule. The idea that, hey, you don't want to be hit, so you don't hit yourself, you know, hit others, right? You know, they, we teach it with the negative. And when we do that, we're missing so much of what Christ is telling us in this passage. See, a goodness which consists in doing nothing would be a complete contradiction of everything that Christian goodness means. Christian goodness, at the very core of what it is, is a call to action. It is not a call to sit idle, but a call to do something to make a difference. And it's not just a feel-good passage to make a difference in serving, but serving so that we might share the good news of Jesus Christ with those that are around us. And so he opens up with this passage that we read this morning. And he says, it's not just that you're not to do harm to others, but that you're supposed to put others before yourself. And that is where Christianity gets hard. Because it's easy maybe to, you know, not hate others. It's easy maybe to not hurt others. It's really difficult to put others' needs before your needs and others' wants before your wants. 
to really truly reflect this idea of living like Jesus and presenting the gospel in our lifestyle, in our actions, and also in our words, the words that we speak. And so Jesus, in this closing, he opens up, he says, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. He goes on to say this, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those that find it are few. I'm going to give you a couple of points just to fill them in so you can kind of uh, listen to the, the rest of the message a little bit and take notes as you want. As we're getting towards the close of this passage, just as we've seen throughout the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, in Jesus' closing argument, we see three things. We see the heart of Christ, to love people, the message of Christ. And we, we also see the call to action. We've kind of briefly hit on that already. And so as he goes and he says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy, that leads to destruction. And there's many, many who enter by it. And the way is narrow, that leads to life. And it is really hard. And there aren't many that find it. We can't help but think of what Jesus also says in John, where he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, that nobody comes to the Father but through me. And he's calling them out, this group out, because here's, and, and our church needs called out today, because here's the truth. Out of evangelical churches today, 30, 37%, only 37% of evangelical Christians believe, or, or rather, 37% of, of evangelical Christians do not believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. How about that? Over a third of evangelical churches believe that Jesus is not the only way to heaven. It gets a little bit worse when you include all, even, or all Christian denominations 52% of all Christian denominations do not believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. And yet, here he's saying it's a narrow gate. And John, he's saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. And so we look at this passage again this morning, and we just ask ourselves, do, is this what I believe? And as if, if it's what I believe, then am I living it out? And the truth of the matter is, even as we dig in a little bit more to this passage this morning, we realize that, you know, it's really easy in our country and in our society today to call ourselves a Christian, even to come to church. But it's a whole other thing to walk out the doors and live out our faith in real and practical, practical and tangible ways. One of my favorite questions to ask is simply this. What part of your faith actually requires faith? Does it require faith for us to get up and come to church this morning? It doesn't require a lot of faith. It requires a little bit of time. It might require a little bit of effort. But can we honestly say that it required faith? To do that. And yet living for Jesus is supposed to call us, right, like the song we just sang, out upon water where our faith is challenged, where our walks with God, right, are at odds with the world. And if they're not, then isn't something wrong? And Jesus says, you know, if life is easy, if our faith is easy, then we really need to be asking ourselves this morning, am I really following Christ? Am I really getting what Jesus is saying? Am I really living for him? What I can say about that is simply this, that choosing to walk with Christ is certainly not always easy. It is always better, but it's not going to be easy. And if our walks are easy, 
then we need to be questioning where we are with Jesus. I'm reminded of the passage where you know, the disciples were saying, Jesus, we're going we're gonna to follow you wherever you want us to go. We're going to follow you. And Jesus responds to them and he says, you know, the, the foxes have, have holes that they're going to sleep in and the birds of the air, they have nests that they're going to sleep in. And the Son of Man doesn't have anywhere to lay his head. He says, is this what you want? The idea where Jesus says, hey, listen, if you want to come after me, that you have to pick up your cross daily and follow after me, is, is this really what you want? That you got to die to yourself and live to me on a daily basis, is this really what you want? Like I said, choosing to walk with Christ isn't always easy, but it is always better. And, and you see that at the very end of verse 14, it says, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. Life that is abundant, that is rich, that is beautiful, that is walking in the blessings of God, that is going to call us much further than we ever thought we would go. It's going to challenge us in ways that we don't wish to be challenged, but it is going to be a life that is certainly rich. Rich in that we get to have a relationship with God. Rich that we get to walk with Him. Rich that we get to share intimacy with Christ and with each other. It's not always easy, but it is always better. He goes on and he says this in the passage, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into fire. And so you will recognize them by their fruits. This morning, what I want to challenge you to do is this. We're getting down to the end of Jesus' message. We're getting down to the end of where we're asking ourselves, am I really living like Jesus? Is, is my life reflect him? And so I want to ask a couple of hard questions this morning. And it's this. Does my life, number one, show the heart of Christ? Does my life regularly show the heart of Christ? Does my life regularly display the message of Christ? Because when we look at this passage and he says, beware of false prophets, right? They're doing all the right things, maybe. They're coming to church, they, they're reading their Bibles, and yet the actions and the attitude of their heart and of their lives, they don't resemble Christ at all. As a matter of fact, just a little ways further in this passage, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. The one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in, in your name? And he's going to declare, I, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of, of lawlessness. And so I'm just asking, if our lives don't really look like Jesus, then are we sure we really have him in the first place? And I get it, nobody's perfect. I'm not asking for anybody to be perfect. But do our lives regularly, regularly reflect the life and the message of Christ? I know one of, one of the quotes that I've quoted often, one that stayed in my heart since I was a youth, was 
the quote that's on the DC Talk CD and where it says, the greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and go on to live by another lifestyle. And now as I read this passage this morning, I, I just was challenged by it. As I read the passage this past week, I was challenged by it that it's really easy to come to church. It's really easy to not do bad things, maybe, or to not do bad things to others. It's a whole nother thing to put others before yourself. It's a whole nother thing that my life and my words match up with who Jesus was and who Jesus is. And so as we close this idea of this living like Jesus sermon, let me just challenge you as a church, as we close out, as we enter into the summer months, how are you living like Jesus? What are you doing for Christ to help the church to grow, to serve those around you? One of the things that we can look at really simply is this next week, our youth are doing a serve Saturday, and they're going out just to be a blessing to our church and to the people in our community, wanting to serve those and make Christ known. A little bit later in the year, we're going to have another Serve Sunday where we're able to go out and say, look, church isn't supposed to be just about us. Or we can go out and serve our community in many ways again. And so I'm just asking you, what are you doing to live like Christ? And if not... Can we recognize that there's something broken? Can we recognize that we either have, at one point in our life, put our hope and our trust in Christ, but we've walked away from that hope and trust? Or perhaps we've never put our hope and our trust in Christ. We've never experienced the salvation that we have been offered freely and then called to live it out before a world that needs it as well. This morning, as Heron comes up here again, I just want to challenge our church to simply, our, do our lives reflect the heart of Christ? Do we display the message of Christ, the gospel that we're putting others before ourselves as Christ did? Or do we simply just need Christ, his salvation in our lives this morning? Whatever the way you want to answer, I just want you to know that the altars are open and that deacons will be up here with me as well to pray with you, to counsel you as you might have need. Let's all stand together. I'm forgiven. Cause you were mistaken I'm accepted You were condemned I'm alive and well Spirit is within me Cause you died and you rose with me Amazing love Amazing love
morning, church. You are. Before we take up our offering this morning, I just want to share with you a couple ways that 
you can partner with us um, uh, in mission at Clough Pike. First off, uh, we this is the last week that we're doing our Annie Armstrong Easter offering, which goes to North American Missions. It is uh, we're only about three hundred dollars away from our goal of three thousand dollars. So that is going on. We pray that um, you have already prayed and that God has already told you what you need to give to make that happen. Uh, secondly, um, you saw how many kids we had up here last week and. From what I've seen around the church today, we have a ton of kids. We actually just started another new kids preschool uh, class. So we just have so many kids here at Clough Pike, which is absolutely awesome. But that means we need help. And so uh, we have VBS coming up. And uh, we need VBS workers, which is our vacation Bible school workers. If you'd like more information, you can talk to Candace. But if you want to help and you already know you want to help, we're going to have lunch downstairs. Um, and you can learn a little bit more about uh, VBS this year and how you can plug in. Um, I already said the youth are having to serve Saturday uh, this next week. And so if you have some work, maybe some trees that need trimming or some grass that needs mowing, and uh, you just don't have the ability to get to it, our youth would love nothing more than to be able to serve you this coming Saturday. And uh, finally, we do have uh, a new group that uh, we're putting together. It's called Connection Team Ministry. And what we're going to be able to do is just help people connect to Clough Pike and what God's doing here from the time they walk in the door and uh, help them learn a little bit more about our church. So if you've ever done visiting or if you don't mind making phone calls, writing postcards to new people that come in our doors, come next Sunday at 6 p.m. and we're going to talk about how you can be a part of that ministry as well. Tim, are you behind me? I'm going to let you give a uh, report about our uh, youth pastor search team and then Joe will pray over our offering. to um, just let everybody know where, where we're at. Josh wanted me to give, give you as a church you know, kind of an update. Um, we started out with 50. I think he sent an email out, but for, for everybody's benefit, I think we got back 50 roughly um, resumes when we initially put the uh, posting out on the site. Um, we've reduced that down to uh, less than a handful, <laughs> put it like that. Uh, we're going to be started. We, we've done the uh, a lot of surveys, um, received back from them. We've checked, started to uh, get the process of looking into um, reference checks, um, things and background checks, things like that. So, and we have a, a, a series of uh, some interviews, um, online Skype interviews uh, tomorrow. And hopefully then from there we'll be able to, to narrow that down to, to give you uh, an update sooner than later on where that's at. So uh, this is the point in time where I know when we was looking for Josh, every the people who came up here for the pastor search committee said, this is the time to pray. So hopefully you've been praying all along, but this would be a real good time right now because we're looking at that um, and being very close on that. So we just uh, covered your prayers and we thank you. God's great. He's, uh, it's good to see him stirring. It's good to see him raising up people. And, and uh, I personally thank him for all he's done for me lately. Let's pray for our tithes now. Dear Lord, as we've come to you this morning, Lord, we've, hear, we've heard your word. We've, sp we've felt your spirit, Lord. We do thank you for that. We thank you for the man of God that you've brought to us. And we do want to give back just a small portion of what you've provided for us and this is our time to do that we raise you up we love you and uh, if someone here today if your heart was beating fast during uh, the invitation seek someone out today uh, to talk to uh, that doesn't happen by chance God is seeking you you need to stand up and, and see what he has in store for you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. This was a song recorded quite a few years ago by a Christian rock band, probably one of the fathers of the founding of Christian rock, Petra. Uh, it's called Road to Zion. You may have. If you're ancient like me, you might have heard of them. There 
Love is a way that leads to life The few that find it never die Past mountain peaks, graced white as snow The way grows brighter as it goes There is a road inside of you Inside of me there is one too No stumbling pilgrim in the dark The road to Zion's in your heart The river runs beside the road its waters living as they flow in liquid voice the water calls on thirsty knees a pilgrim falls there is a road inside of you inside of me there is one too no stumbling the road to Zion's in your heart Sometimes a shadow, dark and cold Lays like a mist across the road But be encouraged by the sight where there's a shadow there's a light there is a road inside of you inside of me there is one too no stumbling pilgrim in the dark the road to zion's in Sometimes it's good to look back down We come so far we gain such ground But joy is not in where we've been Joy is who's waiting at the end There is a road inside of you Inside of me there is one too no stumbling pilgrim in the dark The road to Zion's in your heart No stumbling pilgrim in the dark The road to Zion's in your heart The road to Zion's in your heart The road to Zion's in your heart So one of the lines of that song <coughs> says, joy is not found in our past. It's in the one who we see ahead. Folks, this morning our joy is in Jesus Christ. And if you don't know that, as Joe encouraged us in his prayer, you need to talk to somebody today because you know what? There is nothing greater than to know that I have a, a God that loves me who is ahead, right? Amen? So we're going to sing this morning, blessed be your name as we end this morning. In the land that's plentiful, on the road that's marked with suffering, blessed be the name of Jesus. As we walk out of this place this morning, may the name of Christ be blessed. So let's all stand together. So blessed be the name. Blessed be your name.
a blessing. We will see you soon.